and it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Susan Cook Patton, who is at, uh, uh, at the Nature Conservancy in the uh, USA. And before joining the Nature Conservancy, uh, she was a policy fellow at the US Forest Service and a research fellow at the Smithsonian Institution. And she holds a PhD in community ecology from Cornell and had a bachelor's degree in biology, psychology and English from, from Indiana University. And Susan has been playing a, a particularly important role in synthesizing the global evidence base around forest restoration and the potential uh, uh, for forest restoration and carbon sequestration to forest restoration, and which is what she'll be talking about today. So thank you for uh, coming to speak to us, Susan, and, and over to you. Thank you, and you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, great. And you can see the screen. That's great. Okay, wonderful. Well, it's very nice to meet you all. Um, I appreciate an opportunity for us all to sit together on Zoom uh, across from our respective home offices or wherever you are. I, ho I hope you're doing well. It's, it's a great privilege to be able to speak with you today. And I'm very interested in your thoughts and feedback about the work we're putting together here. So please, um, put questions in the chat as we go along and I look forward to a, a good discussion at the end. So today I'm gonna to be talking about restoring tree cover as a natural climate solution. Um, as you all know, climate change is no longer a thing of the future. It is here and now we are experiencing the effects. Um, this was just something that I pulled earlier this week and showed that across the globe, we're having above average rainfalls and rainfall in places as well as below average rainfall, above normal temperatures, but no below normal temperatures. Um, so we are starting to feel the effects of climate change already. And often I start my day a little depressed when I read the news and see what's happening out in the world. Um, but then usually by the end of the day, I'm feeling much more optimistic because I'm lucky to work at the Nature Conservancy where our focus is on trying to find solutions to the climate crisis. And in particular, focusing on natural climate solutions. Um, as you may already know, natural climate solutions represent a suite of actions or what we call pathways um, that avoid additional emissions or capture emissions from the atmosphere through either the improved management, protection or restoration of our forest, agricultural lands, grasslands and wetlands. Um, Natural climate solutions have the additional benefit, unlike uh, more technological solutions for removing carbon from the atmosphere, like direct air capture, of providing a whole host of benefits, such as supporting economic um, benefits related to sustainable industries and jobs, providing environmental benefits, such as clean air, clean water, um, and improving soil productivity and supporting the conservation of biodiversity. And then of course, uh, building the resilience and supporting the culture and livelihoods of all of us who rely on the land. So in 2017, uh, my team published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that quantified all the different ways that nature could be used to help tackle climate change. Um, and this is sort of the main figure. Here are all of the different natural climate solutions. Can you guys see my mouse? Is that, yes? Okay, so I will continue to point. Um, and you know, here are the ones in the forest, here are ones that fall into agricultural and grasslands, and these are the ones that fall into wetlands. It's a complicated figure, but the you know, main thing to take away is natural climate solutions, avoided forest conversion. We've quantified maximum mitigation potential in 2030 and the 95% confidence interval around that estimate, as well as how much we think could be achieved at $100 per ton of CO2. And we call this $100 per ton uh, a cost effective value, even though it's higher than what you see in most carbon markets today. Um, this is what economists estimate we'll have to pay to adapt to the negative effects of climate change. So better to pay it now to avoid the worst of climate change than to have to pay it to clean up disasters after the fact. Um, and then we quantified how much is available at low cost as well. Uh, what I'm going to be focusing on today is reforestation, but wanted to touch upon the other natural climate solutions first. So if you add up all of those light gray cost-effective uh, values, what nature could provide up to a third 
of the mitigation potential needed in 2030 to keep us at a 1.5 to 2 degree warming pathway, uh, below which we're sort of okay, above which we start having um, catastrophic climate impacts. The important thing to note is it's only a third. <laughs> it's not the solution. Um, the most foundational action is, of course, reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. Uh, strong role to play in addition to um, these energy solutions as well. That third of opportunity can be broken down into sort of general categories of protecting our intact lands, managing our working lands, and restoring native cover. The biggest chunk of cost-effective potential we estimate is through improved management of uh, crops, grazing lands, and forests, uh, followed by protection of intact lands and then restoration. But of course, these sort of global proportions uh, differ depending on where you are. So we have another paper in Philosophical Transactions that came out last year um, that shows how this portfolio of natural climate solution opportunity varies across countries. Um, everything in this brown square or triangle here represent countries where greater than 50% of their cost effective opportunity restoration type actions. Up here in yellow are countries where greater than 50% of their cost effective opportunity falls in the management category. And then this is greater than 50% uh, in the protection category. And then there's a, a suite of countries that are mixed. This is just for tropical countries, I should emphasize. Um, but as I said, today we'll be talking about reforestation, which is the largest opportunity. Uh, if you're paying attention, you'll see that I'm calling it restoring tree cover and reforestation, which I'll explain. And I have a little star here, which I will get to. So first, I'm going to try to use restoring tree cover as the clearest uh, description of, of what I'm talking about, which is basically finding places where trees were historically the natural cover and putting them back. Um, sometimes this is called afforestation, but sometimes they forest plan, so that just confuses people. Sometimes this is called forest restoration, but that could also be things like, um, you know, returning fire to forests that naturally burned. So forest restoration is a little too big. And sometimes this is called reforestation, um, but that also is sometimes a confusing term. So I'll try to stick with restoring tree cover. And the reason that I have the star up here is that it has the largest maximum mitigation potential, but often restoring tree cover can be quite expensive compared to other options, uh, other natural climate solutions, as well as other climate mitigation actions. So we had a paper that looked at the cost of uh, tropical reforestation, restoration of forest cover, um, and tried to figure out how much would it cost uh, to get this at scale across the tropics. And the approach was to use a top-down econometric model where uh, we took layers that showed changes in land use and combined those with layers that quantified gross agricultural revenue across 21 common crops, as well as um, covariates that it were typical drivers, known drivers of forest cover change, which are things like slope, elevation, distance to road, whether or not it's protected status. And the main question that we looked at is as agricultural, you can see tree cover going up. And so the question is how much money, what is the change in, in agricultural revenue there? And then we can say that, okay, if you were to pay a farmer that much money, they might be incentivized to restore tree cover to their land. Hopefully that's clear. And you can use that information to build a marginal abatement cost curve, uh, which basically says how, as you increase the mitigation that you want to achieve, what price on carbon are you going to need? And so as you go right, you get more climate mitigation. As you go up, it gets more expensive per ton of CO2. This is the good part of the graph where you would get a bunch of mitigation for low cost. Um, and the thing to pay attention to here are the green represent the restoring tree cover options, and the brown represents um, avoided deforestation. 
much more mitigation at the same cost than you can uh, from reforestation or restoring tree cover. Um, this graph shows it as well if you just look at the legend. Um, so this is the estimated uh, amount of mitigation you could get at $20 a ton of CO2. And the key thing is the scale here. So we're going from zero all the way up to above 500, whereas the restoring tree cover maxes out around 3540. However, it does vary across the landscape, as you can see. So the darker colors represent places where you have higher mitigation potential uh, per 20 US dollars invested. Um, and in general, we found that of 90 tropical countries, only 21 countries had more mitigation potential at low cost from restoration of tree cover compared to avoid the deforestation. Those remaining countries, uh, it's cheaper to avoid deforestation than it is to restore tree cover. And 17 of those countries uh, where it does appear to be cost effective to restore tree cover are in Africa. So Africa is a, is a promising continent for thinking about restoration. The other reason I put the little star here is that there's really high uncertainty around the estimate of the potential, global potential for restoration of tree cover to mitigate climate. This is to return to that original paper in 2017, where the global estimate was about 10 petagrams of CO2 per year, but the confidence bar actually went from 2.7 up to 17.9. It was so large that um, they chose just to put a little star here to indicate that it was much higher. So what that means is for 10 petagrams of opportunity, there's actually a range of about 15 petagrams of uncertainty. Confidence range is 50% greater than the estimate itself. And I always say that this error bar is the reason I got my job because uh, people were like, okay, you know, this is an exciting opportunity, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty around this and we need somebody to advance the science to help resolve this uncertainty. And when I started at the Nature Conservancy, I would get standard sort of emails like this where they would just say, Susan, you know, I'm gonna do this reforestation project in this location at like ballpark number by the end of the day is great. <laughs> And I would always sort of panic when I got these because I want to give people good estimates. Um, and it's not easy to just get sort of a quick number um, because the mitigation potential is going to depend on location. Are you in a dry tropical forest or a moist tropical forest, for example? The mitigation is also going to depend on the approach. You know, are you trying to restore a natural forest or set up an agroforestry system or a plantation? Mitigation potential is also going to depend on time frame. Uh, so this is just an illustrative figure. <laughs> uh, but if you're thinking about time on this axis and climate mitigation here, if you're growing a fast uh, growing short rotation timber species like eucalyptus, you might get a lot more carbon storage in the short term compared to just letting the forest naturally. Then once you hit that harvest cycle, um, and if the wood is not going into long lived wood products, you're going to wind up with sort of a net uh, lower value than if you had opted for natural forest regrowth. I also didn't mention site condition, but this is also relevant. So depending on where you are, the approach you use, the time frame, and site, um, you're going to get very different climate outcomes. So the question is, how do we get robust estimates of reforestation potential? Um, our approach was to first develop a taxonomy. Um, so we have these sort of three general categories where the intention is to return to a natural forest. You might do that entirely through natural forest regrowth. You might do assisted regeneration where you plant a few trees and then let the forest sort of seed catalyze um, the remaining forest recovery or go out and actively plant uh, many different trees and species, which is what people usually think of when you say restoring tree cover, but that's only one option. Then of course, there's a whole slew of agroforestry practices that I'll talk about more. Um, and then there are timber uh, plantations as well, where you can either plant a monoculture or mixed species. And then we did include this transitional land use, um, where you could start out with a plantation, for example, and then have the native forest grow. Uh, 
And I should mention that uh, the development of this taxonomy happened during a workshop that Yadvinder hosted back in February of 2017 uh, in Oxford. So it was such a pleasure to be there. Um, and, and, and the work has, has grown since then. So after we had this workshop and came up with this taxonomy of what we were talking about, we realized we needed to assemble the existing knowledge base. Um, the good news is a lot of the information was out there. It just had not been compiled into an easy to access, um, readily understandable way. And so we did that. Um, we started by looking at over um, 11,000 publications found the ones that seem to be quantifying carbon stocks in forest recovering via one of those mechanisms, practices I talked about, um, in a forest with a known stand age. So we could calculate rates of at all 5,464 of these and found about 1,400 that fit the bill. And then divided those into um, those different reforestation, sorry, restoration of tree cover practices. Um, a good half of them or almost half of them fell into monoculture plantations. Um, but then they do span these other practices as well. And I should flag that we're working with a lot of people to help build out this data set. So I'm working with um, to a PhD student and a master's student at UC Berkeley. Uh, to build out the monoculture plantation data set. Um, Emily, who I think is on this call, um, is looking at monoculture versus diverse plantations. Um, I've been working with the Crowther Lab at ETH Zurich to look at active planting. Um, and next up, we hope to build out this agroforestry data set. So part of this, the purpose of this call is to share what I'm doing, but also I would love to talk forestry. We're trying to gather the knowledge that's out there. What I will be talking about right now, though, is our natural forest regrowth paper. Um, so to be clear, what does that mean? Natural forest regrowth is the recovery of forest cover on lands that were cleared uh, through spontaneous regrowth after stopping whatever had been previously disturbing the land or however the land was being used. Um, so you know, it could be actions like taking off the cows and putting up a fence. Um, but other than that, there's no management practice to try to accelerate forest growth. Um, this was a very large collaborative endeavor. Um, you'll recognize some of the names on this list. He had vendors in there. I'm looking for his name. There he is. Guy, you're in here too, right? Guy Lomax is in there. Um, and uh, 31 authors across 20 different institutions um, could not have done it and what we looked at after we had compiled these 13,000 field points was what were the main predictors of carb variation and carbon accumulation. Um, we first asked, was it prior land use? The data fell into these general categories of fire, some other form of natural disturbance like hurricane blowdown, um, logging, mining, shifting cultivation, crop or pasture. And what we found was that even though we know these different land uses matter at more local levels, the patterns were not globally consistent. So we set that one aside. The next was to look at the intensity of prior land use. Um, so, you know, it ranged from lower disturbance where you would just have a uh, timber harvest compared to something that has been in agricultural production for a hundred years. You know, there's not a in plow, there's not a lot of rootstock or seed sources left in that system. And so we, the spectrum from low to high intensity influence variation in forest recovery. And again, it was not globally consistent. So we set that one aside. And then the third one we looked at was climate um, using biomes as a proxy uh, for variation in climate and did find that for plant biomass, uh, as you go from sort of warmer to wetter biomes, you got higher rates of uh, stand recovery. So this was great. It meant that we could um, then develop a global model where we predicted accumulation rates across the globe. So we combined the above ground field data with 66 global covariates that span climate, variables like temperature and precipitation, soil, nutrient, chemical and physical properties, radiation, topography, and nitrogen deposition. Um, and 
used those to predict uh, based off of these field points, how much carbon we could get elsewhere. So these blue points are all of the data points that we were able to acquire from the literature. And then we also uh, acquired inventory data from the US, from Sweden and from Australia. And these inventory data really helped um, us to bracket the environmental conditions across the globe. And this is the resulting map that came out. It predicts above ground carbon accumulation in forests that are age one up to 30. Um, it provides spatially explicit estimates at one kilometer resolution. Um, and the important thing to notice here is the hundred fold variation. So we predicted rates across forest and savanna biomes that go from 0.06 tons of carbon per hectare per year up to six tons of carbon per hectare per year. Um, so to identify the areas with the greatest potential carbon returns on investment, what I've done here is just filtered this map to places where we think there's actually a need for additional tree cover. This, you know, many of these places already have forest or their cropland. Um, and again, you know, much higher rates in the tropics than other locations, which is not a surprise. But when you look at finer scale resolution, like within a country, uh, the variation is still important. So this is Colombia as an example. And you can see, depending on where you are in Colombia, you could get from 1.4 up to almost six tons of carbon per hectare per year. We know this is not perfect. Um, there's definitely areas of, of uncertainty. Our highest uncertainty was in across Europe and Asia as well as Northern Africa and Northern US or Canada. Um, but our plan is that we will be able to improve this through time. All of the raw data publicly available through the forest carbon database, which is something that the Smithsonian runs. Um, and we're actually in the process of acquiring even more data and trying to update the model as we go along. The other thing I'll flag is that this is a substantial improvement in spatial resolution over what was available before as defaults. So previously, the best default that you could give people was from the IPCC. It's commonly used 84 out of 99 tropical countries, according to this paper, we're relying on IPCC estimates. Um, but the IPCC provides a single number per eco zone, which is basically, you know, like this blob in purple blob in Africa, and there might be a different one for this purple blob in South America. And we compared our rates to the IPCC and the, the several take homes. First is that the IPCC uh, eightfold variation within ecozones on average. So when I'm showing you here, here are all those ecozones. Um, the white dots represent our average estimated rate for that ecozone, as well as the maximum and the minimum for that ecozone. And the black dot indicates what the IPCC was recommending before. So this dot here does not capture that full range of variation across the ecozone. The other is that uh, IPCC defaults are 30% lower than our rates on average. Um, so the white dots are above the black dots. This is especially pronounced in the tropics where we've had 50% higher rates on average uh, than what they were providing. The other reason we started with natural regrowth is that um, it allows us to have a baseline to compare to other approaches, right? So natural regrowth, you can model across the globe because it's just what nature doing nature's thing. Um, but uh, it doesn't have to, you don't have to account for all the different things that people might potentially be doing to manage their forest. Um, and then you can ask questions like, is it worth the additional investment to plant trees uh, and care for them compared to just letting the forest regrow? How much additional carbon can you get? And as I mentioned, we're, we're working on assessing these other ones uh, with many partners across the globe. The other uh, study pathway I wanted to talk about was trees in agricultural lands. So this is again, that original 2017 paper, trees and croplands suggested, uh, you know, one of the highest opportunities within agricultural lands. But I will flag that these were based on very simplifying assumptions and so are definitely preliminary estimates, but high potential mitigations. 
Agroforestry is also of interest because of its potential to meet sustainable development goals, might help with poverty alleviation and uh, improving food security while capturing carbon and providing habitat for biodiversity, among other things. We are in the decade where we need to tackle climate change and in the decade where we need to advance the sustainable development goals. We are also in the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And so agroforestry is of interest to many because of its potential to maybe be this win for climate plus win for sustainable development goals plus win for uh, um, ecosystem restoration as well. But uh, it still feels like there's a lot of information out there uh, that needs to be compiled, which is what we love to do. <laughs> So we've done a little bit of work on this um, to try to quantify the carbon in agroforestry systems. Um, this was a paper that came out beginning of 2020, um, quantifying the min climate mitigation potential from adding trees to agricultural lands. What we did was to basically develop a global map of above ground woody, woody biomass in crop and pasture lands by um, taking a layer of above ground woody biomass, um, circa 2000 that we updated to 2014. It was at 30 meter resolution. And um, this is the one that you can get from Global Forest Watch. We also incorporated maps of forest cover to try to take out uh, forest pixels from our map um, and to account for any sort of changes in forest cover uh, through time. That was what we used to update it. Um, this is the Hansen layer that did that. We then combined it with a 30 meter resolution uh, raster of croplands and a one kilometer resolution of pasture. This 30 meter GFS AD, which is the Global Food Security Support Analysis Data Layer, um, is a great one. Um, this is just an example of a landscape with a lot of different fields. This was another crop layer that was doing a very poor job of capturing it. This is that pasture layer. Uh, this is another crop layer. And then this GFSAD does a really nice job, you can see, of, of pulling in those croplands. And so what we did was if it was crop, we said it's crop, uh, crop and pasture, we would say, okay, it's crop um, because we had the finer resolution and more recent layer for crop. And this is an example of what the maps looked like at the end. So this is a, a Costa Rica landscape. Um, and you can see the brown and yellow spectrum where yellow equals more biomass. Uh, shows the range of above ground woody biomass within these agricultural landscapes up here. And if you add all of that up, we estimate that there is currently three petagrams of carbon uh, in croplands and 3.8 uh, or nine petagrams of carbon in global pasture lands. This spans over 3.7 billion hectares across the globe. But importantly, only 10% of that large area has more than five tons of carbon per hectare. And we, we use that five tons of carbon per hectare as, um, as a line to say, okay, anything below that is not agroforestry and anything above that is agroforestry. Uh, others have done that as well. Zomer uh, used that threshold in his paper. And we find that the highest agroforestry carbon uh, density is in Africa for both crop land below followed by other tropical countries. Uh, and I put agroforestry in quotes because what we're mapping here is just woody biomass in agricultural landscapes. We don't know anything about the practices, which I'll talk more about. We then took that information further and then said, okay, how much potential additional carbon storage uh, could we incorporate into agricultural lands? Um, and as I mentioned, we don't know anything about what these practices mass. And so we decided to uh, pick a median value um, and extend that across different proportions of the landscape. So this is a hypothetical area where you can see most of the pixels actually are very low biomass. And uh, then we found that threshold that represents 10 tons of biomass or five tons of carbon. 
And if you zoom in, this is our quote unquote agroforestry landscapes. And we find what is that median value? And we assume like, okay, that's a value that's seen with some frequency in these landscapes. Perhaps it represents a viable amount of biomass for agricultural lands. So if you take that value and say, okay, what would it look like if you were to expand that across 1% of agricultural lands, 2.5, 5, or 10% to try to bring those lands up to the median value, what would happen? What would happen if you um, lost 1%, 2.5, 5%, 10, 25% of that carbon, what would result? And we see that 10% adoption would capture very large amounts of carbon, 9.4 petagrams of carbon, compared to 10% loss, which would uh, release about 0 0.7 petagrams of carbon. But as I was mentioning, carbon density does not equal a specific agroforestry practice. Um, and people are not adopting woody biomass carbon into their landscape. They are adopting specific practices with specific species and specific configurations. So this is what we're working on now. And this is where I would love, especially love your thoughts and feedback and advice, um, is to adopt a similar approach to what we did before, is first figure out a taxonomy. What are the different types of agroforestry systems? Agroforestry, there's so many different flavors. It's been around um, you know, it ranges from things like civil pasture to tree intercropping, shade grown cocoa. Um, and what are the different distinctions that are going to matter from a climate mitigation perspective? Um, you know, there's various configurations that might really matter from an economic perspective, like what species um, are you growing? When they can be, can they be harvested? What crop are they producing? But that may not matter from a climate mitigation perspective. Um, so trying to figure out what's the taxonomy that's relevant for climate mitigation. The next thing we're trying to do is to figure out where are those different practices um, for two reasons. The first is the assumption that practices will be easier to scale where they're already being adopted um, rather than trying to convince farmers to adopt an entirely new and unknown practice. Um, and if we have these practice-based maps where we know like, okay, this civil pasture is definitely happening in this location. Can we then leverage those maps with remote sensing methods to map civil pasture or other practices more broadly across the globe? When we have practices, we can also start to quantify how much carbon they hold. So if we can combine that with the map, biomass map that I talked about before and say, okay, this type of practice tends to have this much carbon stored in it as well as complete the literature review that we started four years ago, um, where you can actually quantify carbon accumulation rates in these different agroforestry practices. And then of course, you know, we're doing some work to try to figure out where can we deploy agroforestry as a natural climate solution? And where are the places where you can optimize human health and environmental benefits and as well as economic returns? Um, and then, of course, want to acknowledge the importance of broader enabling conditions like policies and markets that are going to make adoption more or less likely. Um, and think about how can we best monitor progress towards these goals, though I'll say that we are more heavily leaning to advance this and there's already a ton of work in this category already. So our focus is heavily in this earlier part. So with that, um, I just wanted to leave uh, sort of the key take homes from this talk. Um, it looks like I've left plenty of time for uh, questions, which is great, um, which is that restoration of tree cover is a promising natural climate solution and that there are multiple ways to restore tree cover such as natural regrowth and agroforestry, and that the approach you use will influence um, the overall climate mitigation as well as cost and co-benefits. Uh, but you know, reforestation, restoration of tree cover tends to suck a lot of oxygen out of the room. And it's important to remember that there are other natural climate solutions, such as protecting intact ecosystems that are very important. Um, and these are definitely not substitutes for fossil fuel uh, mitigation, even though people like to think they might be. Um, and then last, practices or carbon data, I'd love to hear from you. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take any and all questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you want us to uh, stop sharing the screen? Great. Thanks, uh, that was terrific, really, really nice overview.
So I encourage you, again, I encourage you to switch on your cameras, those of you who are willing to, to switch on, so, and we can open the floor to, uh, to questions for anyone. So either just raise your hand for a question or pop it in the chat. And, and if you can't use your mic for any reason or prefer not to ask directly, just stick in the chat and I can, I can channel those questions. Okay. Uh, I'll kick off while we're waiting for questions to, to come in. Uh, I was thinking back to your, uh, your calculation of uh, by, uh, the bush paper, I think, uh, of, of viability and uh, using agricultural revenue as, as your metric to work out where is viable, etc. And uh, uh, the the revenue obviously has some context on what local income and subs uh, and uh, 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 livelihoods are. So in a in a very poor landscape, a quite low agricultural value, uh, revenue still means subsistence or livelihood and income. So does that analysis take that into account or is it possible that we're missing lands that don't in, in pure economic value have much, uh, much economic value, but actually are essential for livelihoods and subsistence? Yes, great question, Yadvinder. Um, so I would call that a pretty preliminary estimate. And the main take home is that restoration of tree cover is more expensive than avoided deforestation. Um, there's multiple relevant costs um, that you need to think about when actually getting down to sort of project level. Um, one would be opportunity cost um, of being able to use that land for the alternative land use. Uh, the other is uh, just transaction cost of having people uh, to go out there and work with the farmers to find them as well as set up systems for monitoring and acquiring trees um, and implementation cost of, of planting and caring for the trees themselves. Um, and a lot of that is not captured. Plus there's sort of this additional, like even if you pay people, they still may not wanna do it because they've got their own preferences for how to use the land. Um, so we are doing additional work. Jonah's um, leading, Jonah Bush is leading some of that um, to use bottom up cost estimates as well, uh, where we'll have actual um, cost data and return data from, from plots, uh, individual field sites and do more of a bottom up approach, which will do a better job, I think, of capturing sort of the fuller suite uh, of costs associated with um, implementing restoration of tree cover. Okay. Okay, uh, any more questions, anyone? I see Dennis is asking about the availability of the, uh, the map uh, and what resolution is that? It is, it's one kilometer resolution. Um, it's publicly available on Global Forest Watch, um, but I can, uh, I can't multitask, but I can follow up uh, perhaps with the ad vendor afterwards and, and provide the link um, if you can't find it. Um, but yes, please use it. And if you uh, have feedback, let us know. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, I had another question related to that, which is um, on the biomass maps. Now, there's a few available. I'm not quite sure which one I've been using, but um, I've noticed that very often in the tropics, the biomass often seems quite low when you compare it with physical inventories. You know, I've been associated with a few inventories. And when I look at my data and the biomass data, it often looks a bit low. But when you go into the sort of boreal zones or the northern Europe, they look pretty accurate. So I wonder if you have any observation about that. We've we've observed that problem as well, and um, we call it the saturation problem, which is just that remote sensing methods are not good at getting sort of the full biomass within these rich sort of multi-dimensional uh, tree canopy layers that you get in intact forest. Um, so, you know, they're not good at picking up the really early uh, forest development because uh, the trees are just too little and then they're pretty good. And then once you get to more intact forest, um, they tend to saturate uh, too low. Um, so I think, you know, I think the global community recognizes that as an issue and is, is trying to work on it. Uh, but having more field inventory, I think is really hugely useful for, for demonstrating the issue. Before your agroforestry study, what was the source of your uh... The biomass map, I think it was probably one of your slides in the For the agroforestry, it was um, the a global extension of the Zarin et al. layer in 2016 um, that Ali Bettini and others have extended to the tropics. Right. Mm -hmm. Or out of the tropics. Mm -hmm. Looks like Andy has a... Okay, Andy. Nice to see you, Andy. Hi there, Susan. Great talk, thank you. Um, 
how do you, so one of the tr tricky things about tree planting, right, is how long is that carbon going to be in that tree or is it going to be back in the atmosphere due to fire or some other disturbance or so how have you sort of tried to deal with that that sort of issue which which is often a big discouragement to tree planting right or was for a while at least yes excellent question um and it's definitely true for secondary forest and that you know forests grow back fine on their own but then often they don't stay there because people don't value them and, and cut them and clear them again uh beyond just natural disturbance uh so i guess there's several things um the first is that we just sort of de developed a hypothetical growth model on the idea that the trees stay there for 30 years. Um, so you would have to calibrate that if the trees don't stay there. The related to the question about permanence, um, I think the best analogy is what we're all familiar with, with COVID and sort of flattening the curve, right? Like we're trying to flatten uh, the emissions to the atmosphere and go back down. Um, and so even if the trees are not permanent, the time in which they are removing carbon from the atmosphere does help to flatten the curve. Uh, so that's important to acknowledge. The last thing is that we are working on developing additional maps to try to quantify risks of disturbance. Um, and that would be to one, steer people away from places that are at higher risk of burning down, for example, um, and steer towards the places that have a lower risk of, of natural disturbance um, and try to account for how those permanence risks change as our climate warms. Because to date, most of our, our, all of our work has focused on um, historical tree growth and historical climate conditions, which was fine for now-ish, but will get to be an increasingly poor representation of reality as our climate warms. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, just, just to add pitch in on there, I think, I think this permanence question is important, but I think sometimes it is overstated that we often ask more of the land than we ask for other in interventions in, in terms of uh, permanence. And it uh, might take a little bit like uh, uh, Susan's point there, I think, uh, if it's likely to be still there in the next 50 years, I think that's good enough for our 1.5, 2 degrees targets. We don't need this to be 100% sure that it's going to be there 100 years time or 200 years time as well, because it, by then we'd have solved the fund, either we've solved the fundamental climate problem or, or we're totally doomed anyway. So you know, the, uh, what, what, where the forest help is helping us reach that peak temperature somehow in, in the next 50 years. Uh, That's a great point. Yeah, then there, and the other thing too is that you know we we know that these natural climate solutions are are more powerful now, deployed now than later, um, and often talk about them as sort of a bridging mechanism as these more technological solutions for sucking carbon out of the atmosphere are gotten up to scale. Okay, Baker, I think uh, we've probably covered that point on permanence. I don't know whether you wanted to add anything else uh, there. If not, I'll move on to uh, Rory Barber. Do you want to ask your question? Hi there, thanks for the talk. Um, I think Baker's kind of partly answered my question, but I was just wondering from your analysis, if there's any kind of correlation between agricultural intensity, such as yield or productivity, versus the differing carbon mitigation potential you witnessed in different agroforestry schemes. Um, it may well have been outside the scope of your analysis, but I think in the context of kind of land sparing versus land sharing debates that we're having in biodiversity, it might be quite an interesting avenue to look at. I'm just wondering. Great question. Um, so the original definition for trees and croplands that count as a natural climate solution was the incorporation of additional trees into the landscape without negatively impacting yield, <laughs> which is I uh, more is a complicated definition because one, you know, as you put more tree cover in the landscape, you are going to shade out whatever the crop, the other crop is. Um, it might be okay for some things like co coffee, but there's an, uh, there's a limit. Um, but the trees that you add could also be revenue generating. So it could be a timber tree, it could be sort of a fruit or nut tree. Um, and so there is benefit to diversifying economic streams as well because the market for any individual crop may fluctuate widely and you could help diversify and, and stabilize your um, 
the economic returns to the farmer by having these additional crops. So it's not just thinking about what happens to the, the crop that was there before, um, but that is something that we're trying to figure out like, okay, what is a viable amount of biomass that you can get into this landscape without negatively impacting productivity. Um, in some cases, it's a good bit. So like civil pasture, for example, often um, you can get a good bit into these grazing lands because the, the cows or whatever the livestock can graze from the trees themselves. Um, and in places that are really hot, the trees can help to shade the cattle and they, they're happier and grow healthier. And so you don't get a diminishment uh, in their growth rates. But, but you're right, there's a line. I don't know what that line is and, and we're trying to, to figure it out. Okay. Uh Okay, Baker, you have another question there. Do you want to ask that directly? Or as a comment? If not, I'll, I'll channel it. Uh, so it's, a, it's the issue of leakage. So I say with coffee agroforestry, the more tree cover you have, the lower the yield would be. So is there an issue of economic leakage, essentially, that if you're, if you're lowering yields, are you intensive, extensifying the, uh, uh, the forest cover loss? Yeah, so leakage is definitely something else to keep in mind. Um, you know, we do build these sort of safeguards and assumptions into our models where we say, okay, um, we're going to protect the existing footprint of cropland, uh, but that does assume that you'll be able to feed a growing population on the existing footprint through intensification of production. Um, and what I was saying before about like, oh, okay, this we're only gonna incorporate enough trees to not negatively impact yield. Um, but we need to figure out exactly what that number is. Uh, I will say that um, in other work we've looked on is, is how natural climate solutions differ in their leakage potential. Um, so restoration of tree cover is on the higher leakage end because you're displacing the current land use as well as things like avoidive forest conversion. Um, and th that may uh, suggest that improved forest management practices where you're just improving the management but not changing the land use are going to be better suited in places where there's high risk of leakage um, to other locations. I mentioned though, we, uh, we did some work a few years ago around uh, coffee agroforestry in Ethiopia and cocoa in Ghana and found that while higher tree covers, particularly for coffee, did to reduce yield so much, they did increase resilience. So when there was a, the El Nino year, the drought year, uh, the, 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 the plantations with higher tree cover were, were able to maintain yield uh, during the extreme event. So in the context of climate variability and adaptation, there may be uh, a, an optimum combination of agroforestry or, or tree cover uh, and uh, and yield that so the, the, the mean average yield is, is not the only metric to consider in terms of uh, livelihoods and, and incomes there the resilience to extreme events might be quite important so uh, okay uh, Shyam has a question but he, he says has a microphone problem so I'll uh, I'll uh, channel it so he was uh, he was wondering about uh, uh, trees outside of forest uh, uh, roadside or urban trees and whether yeah, some of this analysis incorporates the potential for urban tree restoration. Yes, great question. So we have um, excluded urban trees from these analyses just because it requires different carbon accounting. Usually you're quantifying carbon um, per tree rather than per hectare, which is what we're doing here. The other reason is that um, urban trees can have these much larger cascading effects through um, reduced energy use because it cools the city in the summer and can help keep it warmer in the winter. And the carbon alone just doesn't account for that much broader um, uh, benefit, um, but definitely important. And there are others at the Nature Conservancy that are trying to quantify the potential uh, for urban and uh, roadside um, increases in tree canopy. Okay, uh, and oh, I see Guy, your hands up there. Do you, do you have a question? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, Hi Susan, nice to see you. Nice to hear a bit about the sort of latest uh, research that uh, you've been doing. Um, my question, I guess, you know, it's something that I think we talked about in the, the sort of earlier stages of the paper. Um, but I'm interested if you kind of if you started doing it more, uh, thinking about it. Now you're bringing in sort of the wider parts of the taxonomy and looking at assisted regeneration. Um, 
that's the you know, with natural regeneration the kind of the assumption is that if you if you do leave a, an area of land then uh, you long enough then it will regenerate um and there, there may maybe sort of reasons why that does or doesn't happen depending on the, the history of the land and how close it is to a, a forest um so yeah do you do you know sort of any of any work that's been done to try and look at those limiting factors and um where they where they might be important compared to where places that uh, are that you could trust that the forest could regenerate or is that something that's too context specific to to grapple with i mean there are there are known from other uh people's work known factors that influence the likelihood of regrowth um so proximity to existing forest and other seed sources um or if there's seed stock or root stock um, within the soil um places that are less highly degraded are not full of invasive grasses. Um, it's a question I get a lot where people are like, okay, great. Like you're telling us that the forest can regrow on our own, like where? <laughs> like, well, you're gonna have to do sort of a site level assessment to figure out the likelihood um, of regrowth. But I do think it's an underappreciated um, opportunity. You know, people just like to plant trees and we feel like we need to plant trees. Um, but in many cases, the forest can grow back on their own for a fraction of the cost in the places where it makes sense. Um, but there is of course a time and a place for, uh, for tree planting as well. Yeah. If you need certain species to come back or if the site is too degraded um, for the forest to recover on its own. Okay, thanks. Yeah, if you have sort of a fragmented landscape then maybe that's more, more feasible than a, a, sort of a patch that's 100 miles from the nearest forest. Exactly. It seems to be a competition with grasses and whether invasive or native, uh, seems to be a key factor that sometimes the grasses just prevent re-establishment of, of trees, even if there's a seed bank, et cetera, there. Mm. So, thank you. Okay, any more questions from anyone? Uh, Gianluca? Hi, thank you. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I have, I guess, a question with, with these, uh, maps of huge areas of, of restoration potential that show really quite significant variation in, in these potential. Are there any like decent efforts to try and see how that restoration potential varies among different land ownership um, types? And even I'm just thinking with the um, potential just within farmland, I guess it makes a big difference whether it's the high potential is disaggregated among many thousands of really small farms or whether it's across maybe bigger, bigger, bigger areas in terms of how you actually go about deploying that. But I was just wondering if, if there's any, uh, uh, these global scales, I know it's super hard to get the underlying social data, but like with things like the land matrix and global field sizes and all these kind of data, can they be used at all to, to give some inferences about where areas of high restoration potential overlap with areas where you could actually incorporate or deploy these, these strategies? I see Trisha came back on camera, which is great because I was just going to talk about her. Um, so when we talk about overall mitigation potential from restoration of tree cover, there's sort of two factors. One is how much carbon can you get? And the other is where the heck are you going to put the trees? And that latter question is the much more controversial question because it really depends on like who owns the land, what do they want to do with it? And so those analyses I think are best done at a smaller scale. And we have a paper that just came out um, in One Earth that maps opportunity across the US, which I didn't talk about, um, where we did try to account uh, for ownership. Um, and Tricia co-led that project with me. Um, and the approach we took there was not to be prescriptive, like you should put trees here, but like here is a menu of different types of options. Um, and, and this is who owns the land, because that is important. You know, most of the opportunity was in the east, but most of the federally managed lands are in the west. So if you're trying to think about changing public policy, it's a western strategy. Whereas if it's uh, you're trying to incentivize restoring tree cover in the east, you have to think about, you know, distributed outreach to many different private landowners. Um, it's a very different strategy that you would adopt there. And I'll put, it's, we have a pretty slick web tool um, that show, allows you to explore the findings. I'll put it in the chat. It's the reforestationhub.org. Um, and I know Trisha is working on similar uh, maps for uh, India, and uh, I have colleagues working on similar maps in Canada. So it's sort of eventually maybe we'll cover enough of the globe to, to have those detailed analyses, but, but they're still just coming online. Mm 
Okay, Anthony. Hi, Susan. Uh, a really great talk and a really great amount of work that you've been doing. That's fantastic. Thanks for, thanks for doing that. Um, it sounds like you've brought together a huge number of different data sets and your work has been primarily looking to the future and looking to solutions and mitigation potential. I wonder if you've thought about how or whether your data sets that you've brought together could be used to look back in the past and look at um, net or gross land use change um, and land cover change emissions. The Global Carbon Project has only got a couple of those kind of data sets in there at the moment and uh, could do with a couple more for sure. You know, we have been so like forward solutions oriented that I've never considered that question. Um... That's, I'd have to think about that more. Good question. Cool. Look forward to a conversation about it. Yeah, if you can get what you think about that somehow the, the rest, the regrowth calculation, the global carbon budget could be informed by, by the, these estimates? No. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, the, the, the regrowth and the, the, the carbon numbers that you have and the, the, the high resolution that you've used the high resolution of those different numbers that you've got as well, I think is, is a higher resolution than a lot of these, than the previous land use and land cover change products, I think. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in that field, but it's something that I'm getting interested in. I think they, they have a more coarser disaggregation of the land surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Uh, good, interesting idea. Okay, uh, Tricia, you have a question. Yeah, hi Susan, thanks for the great talk. I was just wondering um, with the new project uh, focusing on agroforestry and you mentioned that the taxonomy mostly will be tackled by uh, TNC and the rest of the bits will be tackled by other, um, other folks. Uh, do you have some a sense of what your uh, like results, what are you hoping to um, deliver uh, in terms of yeah you're going to build out this taxonomy like what uh, the different categories of the taxonomy will be uh, is there like criteria based on geography like asian countries will be very different from african countries and south american countries and also do you have a sense of um, again the deliverable in like the format is it going to be like an online tool or i don't know some excel database or it's going to be absorbed into say Smithsonian or WRI's infrastructure. So I guess two separate, like how does the product look or what will it look like? Uh, all, all of the above. Um, and I should say, when I say we, that includes TNC and a ton of external collaborators. So yeah, we just definitely not us alone. Um, and we're trying to leverage as much expertise as we can. Um, so we're envisioning three products. Um, one is sort of a remote sensing methodology to try to map individual agroforestry practices. And there the relevant taxonomy might be as coarse as like lines versus scattered trees versus patches, right? Like, I don't know how much you can actually do with remote sensing, but we, we know we could do that. And then the question is how much further sort of refined mapping of practices can we get? The other is just sort of a review of the knowledge base, like a big, um, you know, what do we know about agroforestry as a climate solution? And then the last thing is a uh, giant Excel spreadsheet database, similar to what we did for natural forest regrowth. Um, and uh, the plan is mm, to get the, the raw data out there to the global community via uh, the forest carbon database that the Smithsonian leads and helps to feed the data to the IPCC. Um, and we'll have maps up uh, at whatever resolution we're able to do for agroforestry, um, probably on TNC sites as well as elsewhere. Cool, I look forward to looking at India. I was wondering in your, your current assessment of agroforestry, it essentially is woody cover on land that's being used as a, as a crop land. So part of that, it probably could, it could be described as inefficiently cleared land where people didn't have the resources to fully clear the, their land. So rather than it being that the remaining trees are serving some sort of function or purpose, that they're simply very marginal crop lands uh, as well. Uh, 
That's exactly would right. You count, would you count that as agroforestry once you get a more refined analysis? Or would you, yeah. <laughs> we have we have another paper that we're about to submit that looks at cooling services from civil from woody biomass within pasture lands. Um, so it doesn't matter if the trees are deliberate or not; they are providing mm -hmm. cooling services to um, the local community there. So it is sort of a you know we usually say deliberate incorporation of trees and shrubs into agricultural lands. Um, but you know there are cases where the trees are just there and they're still providing important services. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Great. Viola, you have a question? Hi, hi Susan. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm Viola. I'm from the University of Bristol. And um, I had a question. It's probably outside the scope of your like current aims, but I was wondering. We've primarily talked about above ground carbon so far. I was wondering if you'd consider expanding that to the below ground carbon with respect to some of these different approaches, like the natural regrowth and the impact that that has on below ground carbon versus uh, agroforestry, for example, if that's something you're considering. Yes, so we did look at um, both below ground root biomass as well as soil and coarse woody debris and litter in our natural forestry growth work. I just didn't talk about it. Um, the below ground data is uh, less, that pool is less well covered than the above ground. So we focused on the pools where we had the most data. Um, and we did actually develop maps that are, um, that include below ground biomass, but just based off of uh, IPCC root to shoot ratio. So we don't have good quantitative data there. We spent a lot of trying trying to figure out soil, <laughs> but uh, my conclusion is just the, the data are far too noisy. Um, what you would really want would be sort of a pre post measurement. And we had that we found a few examples of those more often, it would be like, here's the recovering forest, and here's an adjacent crop land. Um, so let's compare, uh, or just a sheer chrono sequence where it's like a one-year-old forest, three, five. Um, and um, the data were very noisy. There have been other meta-analyses. There was one that Powers led in 2011. And the conclusion was that recovering forest um, captured about 0.3 tons of carbon per hectare per year. And then there was a US one across hundreds of thousands of plots, I think. But again, they came to like 0.2 to 0.4 tons of carbon. And then our sort of global default was 0.4 tons of carbon. <laughs> they're just like, okay, like there's so much important resolution out there that we just can't capture and 0.4 tons of carbon is a good default. Um, but I think uh, with agroforestry, we'll really want to crack that open given that improvements in soil fertility is one of the key co-benefits from agroforestry adoption. Um, and so maybe we'll get luckier and be able to provide some resolution there, but I suspect the data again will be very noisy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Gianluca, you have Hi, yes. Uh, that just made me think of something. Sorry. So th these um, maps of potential uh, carbon accumulation, uh, so there's for agroforestry and for secondary forest regrowth, is there any effort to map the potential that could occur in like the huge areas of standing forest that have, have been degraded by like logging or, or anything like that? Because it seems that, that, that's like a really massive area. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to know what, what's out there for that. Thank you. Right, yeah, so um, Bill Mumal has this idea of proforestation, which is just sort of letting forest grow and increase in density. And, and, and um, we did not capture that mostly just because we have sort of our like lanes that we stay in. And I focus on the transition from that forest to forest. But there definitely is mitigation potential to increasing stand density and letting forest uh, in increase in age. Um, and I think that that does merit some more work. What we have done is model extended rotations and plantations um, with the idea that most plantations are harvested at their economic optimum rather than the biological optimum. So that sort of gets you there. Um, and we will be redoing our model for sort of older secondary forests to see like, okay, we looked at one to 30 years, what happens when you go from 31 to 100 years? But, but that's as far as we've gotten. There's a, there's a lot of additional work to think about how do you um, improve degraded stand condition for climate mitigation. Okay, great. Any more questions? If not, I think we're, we're coming to a close. Uh, we have a bit of a tradition in these seminars to at the end for people to unmute their microphone so we can have 
or audible applause for our, our guest speaker. So uh, please unmute him and give, give, give us, give us an old fashioned audible applause. Thank you all. Thank you for the invitation. It was great to be able to share our work with you. Um, and uh, I appreciate all your questions and feedback. Thank you, Susan. It was a 